So, um, since the beginning of the course, I have always felt that we need to talk about the oil sands, and we've never done that. And uh, I, I attempted to do it in all the wrong ways. It's kind of uh, amusing. I wrote to the Dean of Engineering, who you know has served as Dean of uh, Engineering for about 18 years, and is probably the most powerful person within the university. And he immediately recognized that this email from this obscure pathologist did not need to be replied to. And so it's one of the few emails that I've sent in my professional life that I get absolutely no response to. You're not obscure. <laughs> but anyway, um, then, some of you may know about the idea of meetups. Meetups are um, spontaneous events where you get together with people that you share interests with. And when they began, I was unbelievably enthusiastic. I remember telling many groups of people how wonderful this was going to be. But usually it's not very wonderful. The people who think they'd like to meet you are not people you'd like to meet, and so on. There are many difficulties with meetups. And I would say that maybe the only really successful meetup I ever had was a Leonard Cohen meetup, where I was interested in Leonard Cohen, I was meeting other people who were, and Ken Chapman showed up. And he turned out to be a really, really interesting person. But beyond that, you know I have this great interest in that five weeks that Leonard Cohen spent here at the uh, university, and I secondarily know a lot about it, but uh, he was actually here at the time, and, and so this, this was wonderfully exciting uh, for me. So anyway, I could go on and on, but that would detract from the time that he, uh, he would then spend telling you about the oil sands, and the fact that we all own the oil sands. We all have a combined responsibility to figure out. It's sort of like a poorly behaved adolescent child, you know? I mean, a lot, it's complicated, our relationship with this oil sands that we own. So, uh, Ken, would, would you like to come down here and you and Angus can Figure things out, yeah. But I'm very grateful to you for years after I first decided we should speak on this subject, actually making it happen. Thanks, Kim. Uh, I'm quite intimidated by this audience. I've spoken in front of thousands of people, but I'm quite scared of you guys because uh, I don't know who in the hell you are. Okay. <laughs> I really enjoyed on a cold, cold Saturday afternoon in the 1st of March um, being here. It's been quite relaxing, it's been quite informative, it's been very entertaining. And I think I'm either the odd man out or the skunk at the garden party as to what we're really trying to do here. So I'm trying to find my place. Let me, let me start um, with some of the serendipity of all this. As, as Kim mentioned, I'm a big, big Leonard Cohen fan. And was hanging around. I was on campus in 1966, uh, failing commerce uh, dramatically, and discovering the week that I saw Cohen here and following him around like a puppy dog that my destiny was not business but English. And I, would, I ended up being a lawyer because the woman I was dating and following Cohen around at that time. Um, ended up being my wife of 45 years. Uh, the secret of a good, strong marriage is a very bright woman with a short attention span. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she went into grad school in uh, clinical psychology and majored in behavior modification and always thought she wanted to be a lawyer. And she just discovered it was easier to use her techniques and technologies and turn me into a lawyer. And so I ended up in law school. But my, my connection with Cohen was absolutely that week he was here was quite profound for me because I had enjoyed English in high school, but it was 
not quite an epiphany, but more of an epiph, that I realized I should change faculties, that I really should go into English and ended up in an English and an economics minor so I could get, a, get credit for the accounting courses that I actually passed in commerce. Uh, but I've had this passion for his work and his life ever since. And I have one more anecdote on all this is that my wife can't stand him. She says, in her role, she says, I work with depressed people all the time. Why would I call it entertainment? <laughs> I was uh, the last Team Canada event that Jean Chrétien put on in, in, in Dallas, Houston, and Los Angeles, I went on. And in the Los Angeles side, they had all the expat Canadian entertainers there, uh, from Paul Anka to Joni Mitchell to David Foster and, and Leonard Cohen. But there was this reception at lunch where Cohen was there, and I had this other serendipitous moment. Serendipity has always been my long-range plan, in that I ran into him in the lobby. And I said, Mr. Cohen, uh, you've heard this, about, this lie a thousand times, but this time it's the actual truth. I have never asked anybody for an autograph, but I really do want your autograph for my wife because she can't stand you. And, and I think that it would be just poetic justice on our anniversary if I gave her that as an anniversary gift. And he was right into it. And, okay. <laughs> and so he signed this program. And of course, when you're on these trips, you collect all this bump, right, that you don't need. And I threw the damn thing out with a whole bunch of other bumps. And it's one of the tragedies of my life um, and one of the great reliefs of my wife. <laughs> but, um, I was intrigued by the fact that he's going to be here again. Uh, in, not here again, but we're going to celebrate that 50 years later. And I'm going to get to be a part of it. And I'm going to get to be a part of it with you, too. And I really enjoyed both of you. And, uh, and Marianne was. It, it brought back a whole bunch of memories for me today. But that's enough about my reminiscence. This is about future day, not Ken Chapman's past. Um, let me talk to you about future day in the context of the oil sands. The subject of my presentation is the incredible complexity of being a responsible owner of the oil sands. As an Albertan, you are, by law, an owner of that resource. And as an owner, you have a great blessing. As an owner, you have an enormous burden, the responsibility of seeing that it is done responsibly and sustainably, and in the context of climate change, morally. It is time for the engineers to pass the torch of oil sands development to the humanities. And I think it's about to happen, not overnight, but within the next three to five years. And let me tell you why I think that. There is an awful lot being said and misled about this resource in many, many ways. The polls show that 20% of the population think it should be shut down, and it's a terrible curse on the planet. There are 20% of the population think that it is a timely and appropriate wealth-creating resource that should be exploited for all it's worth. There are 60% in the middle who don't know what to think, who to believe, who to trust, and they respect none of the other players. The other players are in echo chambers and talking across an abyss from their own camps and their own tribes. That is tiresome, boring, and dangerous. The 60% in the middle are uncertain. If they go indifferent, we are in serious, serious trouble. If you're uncertain, as you saw earlier, the best antidote for fear is information, we don't survive in this situation merely on information. The information we have, we don't know if it's authentic, authoritative, factual, or trustworthy. The reality is, is it's yes and no. There's a lot of cherry picking of facts on both sides of that hardly debate, of that polarized diatribe. What we have to do is change the narrative. 
And the narrative has to change, in my opinion. I'm a lawyer, so I wouldn't say my humble opinion. That would be misleading you, too. Uh, the opinion, in my opinion, has to change from an adversarial regulatory conversation, <clears throat> not away from that. There's a place for that. We have to expand, extend, and deepen the conversation into a more integrated, comprehensive, triple bottom line approach. And what I mean by that is triple bottom line has become a cliche in some circles. I don't think it's a cliche if you take it in present and future tense. And that is you have to combine prosperity with stewardship of the planet and well-being of species, not just people or persons, but species. And we have to look at that on an integrated basis. Industry right now and politicians are seeing that as a continuum, as an arc. We started off figuring out, is there a business here? We started in 64, same time as Cohen was around, when he was just starting out. Nobody made money in the oil sands till 1998. There are only nine companies actually producing oil. We didn't know how or if there would be a business there. When they figured out how to extract the oil from the sand, it was costing $18 a barrel to do it, and oil was selling for $12. So go figure, it ain't going to happen. But then the Middle East oil crisis took off, and oil prices took off, and then it started to happen. That was the first boom. We figured out how to do it, open pit. Then there was new technologies that came around that allowed us to get at the deeper stuff with drilling and horizontal drilling and, and SAG-D, at steam-assisted gravity drainage. Um, that gets to oil at 400 to 600 meters below the surface and much more, 80% of the extractable oil comes from that source. You've seen the last of the pits. They'll get bigger, but you won't see more of them. They'll get bigger and they'll reclaim. But that's where it's at. They then realized, because of pressures from ecologists, environmentalists, scientists, and political pressures from abroad and market pressures, that the environment had to be dealt with now in real time. The environment was always going to be something that was going to happen on somebody else's watch that would be dealt with eventually, but we were trying to figure out the business, and we were into a boom. It was big bucks, big trucks, and big barrels. Then it became, how do we make this greener and cleaner and safer, as well as more innovative? That environmental element is happening now. And the industry, I worked for the industry for two years. I was based out of Fort McMurray and I worked for the, a group called the Oil Sands Developers Group. 31 different oil sands development companies including uh, a pipeline, a power company, a water company, an aggregate company uh, that all support the industry. Enjoyed that work immensely. But I learned a lot about the industry from the inside. And then, so they Leaders, there's a group of, they call themselves the Oil Sands CEO Council. There's a group of 16 companies who came to the realization that the competitive model, the market model, was really good for a whole bunch of things, but not for everything. And it wasn't any good in the environment. The ducks did it. At the beginning, they were, it was the Syncrude ducks. Before that was over, it is now the oil sands ducks. And that was a travesty of the highest order. Now, you can rationalize, first thought it was 500 ducks, and then they were forced to admit there were 1,600 ducks. Um, but that was a shot heard around the world. And that was the game changing in terms of the attitude, even of Albertans, that this isn't being done responsibly, this is not being done sustainably, and this is not being done consistent with our values. And Syncrude took it to court on a technicality and tried to win. Lost badly and suffered the largest fine 
in the history of environmental legislation in the country. So the writing on the wall said, we have to look as an industry at collaborating around the environment. We don't live by the standards of the best of us, we live by the standards of the worst of us. And so we have to bring the bottom end up and we have to continue to grow those who are the most progressive in terms of this kind of environmental engagement. The studies that had been done and the work that had been done in, lar in large part was good work, but there was significant amount of the work in the environment had been done that was less than shoddy. And people didn't trust any of it then. Uh, and as a result of that, they've looked at joint monitoring. The feds came in, nobody trusted them. Nobody trusted the feds and the province to work together. The industry and the feds and the province are trying to work together and the industry is writing a check. But we're not sure that we're getting the best science and the best scientists on this yet. And this is environmental science that we're working on. We're getting there. The good news about the collaboration is I personally think the collaboration is real. I think it's authentic and I think it's going to stick. The, the CEOs who are there now are not the same CEOs that entered into that collaborative spirit. It's continuing on. There is succession in those values. At least to one more generation, we'll see what happens next. But what they did is they agreed to pool all the funding that they were putting together and all the research that they were doing themselves and contracting into, from these 16 companies into one great big honking pool and they'd all share it collaboratively, and they would all develop it collaboratively. And they're working in four areas of air, land, water, and tailings. Now, they haven't made public yet any of the work that they're doing. You can see there's about, if you go to the, it's called COSIA, the Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance. They're looking at breakthrough technologies in, in the environment that will help resolve the major economic environmental issues in those areas on an integrated basis. They're not seeing land separated from water and air separated from tailings. They see it all as a systematic whole. And in the work that you're doing, Kim, it's all about systems, and it's all about natural systems. We are now starting to get to the point where I think the industry is getting a bit of an aha that instead of trying to engineer their way out of natural systems, they should be looking at how they adapt themselves within natural systems. And let me tell you, one real life, real time example of that happening now. And it's not happening in the oil sands, it's happening in the town of Fort McMurray as a result of the oil sands. The city of Fort McMurray, the city council in 2010, decided collectively that they were going to be, as their aspiration, the most livable, sustainable northern community on the planet. And to that end, they decided they would aspire and deliver a zero waste culture and society in Fort McMurray. They banned plastic bags. Small gesture, small gesture. But it's a big, it's a big difference. Um, how that happened was a 17-year-old high school student this went, made a pitch to city council that they should, as, a, as just good ecological uh, stewardship, ban plastic bags. The city council of that day laughed him out of the chamber. So he went and got all his friends and he organized a petition. He brought the petition back with the same pitch to a new council and they adopted it. And instantaneously, there were plastic bags gone. Now, they reviewed that policy a couple of times. It's still there. It's not disappearing. It's getting better and more adaptive. They're getting better at it. But that's just one simple little thing. That little black swan triggered a different kind of consciousness. And then they looked at their waste. The people in Fort McMurray on a per capita basis are the largest producers of municipal solid waste on the planet. And it's because of the construction. There's so much construction going on and relatively few people. They have, a, they have a, a landfill, and they're, they're down-to-earth people. They don't call it a landfill. They call it a dump. And they take in their dump, and they've, taken the pro they've bought it from, this, from, the, from the province, and they're turning it into an eco-park. But here's the cool thing. They have, received, they have developed 
a gasification process. In Edmonton, we have a gasification process, too, on a plasma basis. We run at about 1,500 degrees Celsius. Their gasification process fits inside a shipping container. It runs at 450 degrees Celsius, and it takes 10 tons a day. They generate 100 tons a day of white, municipal solid waste. This, the reason they did 10 tons is because they don't have to go through an environmental impact assessment to do this as a demonstration project. But they are now, it hasn't been set up yet. It's, it's coming, and it'll be there and operational in April or early May. Um, but you put this waste in at that, at that temperature, you get your metals back, you get your glass back, you sort out paper, and you sort out plastic. And that generates enough electricity to power 220 homes. They are looking at getting off grid in Fort McMurray, using their own waste to do it. But when you take that and you gasify it, you generate three things. Carbon dioxide, heat, and ash. They take the ash, they add other additives to it, and they use it for concrete. They need concrete in a growing area in an industrial place like that. They're capturing the CO2, they're capturing the heat, they're putting lighting with it, and they've got an aquaponic greenhouse system growing local food. Now, there's one greenhouse there already operating. There's a second one that was just started a week ago, and there's a third one that's coming. But they are growing local food out of their own waste, and, they're, and they're gonna, they can do that uh, at about 20,000 pounds of food a month out of that. One of those greenhouses being totally dedicated to their food bank up there. Now we're talking integrated, comprehensive systems. We've got an economic system, because that can be a business for local people. That is an environmental situation, and it's providing food on a local basis, on a social basis. Now, what's being talked about is with these SAG-D operations, is that they generate an awful lot more CO2 than the pits do. But the good news is you can capture it. The open pits generate it primarily from the trucks and the shovels and the upgraders. You can capture it up the upgraders, but there's not a much there to do. But the CO2 plants, the big pressure cookers, generate a lot, but they can capture it. They're looking at putting these greenhouses beside their units and using it to grow trees and other food on a local basis. I expect, and I'm prepared to predict, in five years, the second largest exporter to Fort McMurray will be vegetables, fruit and vegetables, coming into the rest of the way. That means those trucks that are bringing all the other supplies up won't come back empty. They'll come back with food. Now, if we start insisting on that as owners of that resource, this comprehensive, integrated, natural systems approach to responsible and sustainable development, it will happen. If we stay indifferent or uncertain, it won't happen. We as the owners have to take that responsibility, and we do that through the political process. Or you can also do it through an anarchist process. You can also do it through a lobbying process. You can do it through a demonstration process. I'm a front end 60 guy, I was there. Graduated from law school with the longest hair in my class. And proud of it. But my point being is that it's about to take off, that we need to do that. The other side of it, looking at this audience, is on the social side. We have to look at regeneration, restoration, and reclamation right now. And it's just about starting. It's ready to go. There's enough work being done. There's one, there's really only one site that's a genuine reclamation. The Syncrude site with the bison is just a reclamation of an overburden, okay? Stuff that they piled up when they built the, built the pits is that they've actually regenerated that, and it's a reclamation standard, but it's not the kind of thing we really need. We need to fill those tailing ponds in, and we have to do them safely. We have to look at all kinds of other possibilities in terms of reclamation. And as we do SAG-D, and these little sites are not gonna be pits, but there's gonna be fragmentation all over the place with power lines, with pipelines, and roadways, and, and these pads. That's gonna really, and the CO2 coming up, which we can capture, remember, but the habitat protection 
and for, for other species. We, we're going to mess them up unless we start doing this in a more intelligent way and, and systemic way in terms of living and cohabitating with other species. Because you have to remember, we are in the boreal forest. And we have to do it in that context. Again, as citizens, you have to start thinking of that and starting to make, educate yourself and starting insisting on higher standards of your politicians and of those people who are running these companies. I was, two weeks ago I was at McGill at the Petrocultures Conference. It started here in 2012. It's a joint venture between the U of A and McGill. And we were occupied at that conference. And um, it was quite fun. I, I missed it. I, I was a little bit late, but I enjoyed those days around this campus doing stuff like that. Uh, but it was, it was a significant and serious moment. M many of the young students that were in the audience there were part of Divest McGill, saying, get your university investments out of the oil sands. My argument to them was, is get your university students to buy shares in oil sands companies and start making insistence as an owner of the asset and as owners of the companies and start working it that way, working the political side and the economic side for these other kinds of integrated comprehensive approaches. The third element in this is that Aboriginal, the fourth element actually is Aboriginal, which leads me into the social side, is that we are, we are doing an amazing, amazingly bad job as a nation in dealing with Aboriginal relations. And in the oil sands, we're doing a disservice to Aboriginal people and to the companies at the same time. Because what's happened is, is that the courts have decided, I think very correctly, that the treaties require that, we, that Aboriginal rights be honored and respected and they be accommodated, okay? And so even our, even our Constitution, Section 35, says nothing in that Constitution will abrogate in any way the rights of Aboriginal people. And those rights have now been, the consul, they have to be consulted in a free, uh, in, uh, informed and prior consent basis. And if you can't mitigate, you have to accommodate. And accommodation has come down to how big is the check? Because the companies can't do much else other than that. We have sovereign nations living within our nation. You can think about Quebec separation and of a sovereign nation in Quebec. We have hundreds of them in Canada already that we have to deal on a government-to-government -government basis. Our governments, both primarily federally, but provincially as well, have, uh, have delegated or abdicated, in my opinion, that responsibility to industry. So when industry wants an environmental approval, they have to make sure that they've consulted and they've accommodated where, as required, the, the Aboriginal treaty rights. And that comes down at the end of the day as to how big the check is. Now, there are other good elements in that, um, like jobs and prosperity and opportunities, and there's good examples of companies trying to do that, which is within their realm. But understanding education and health and all the other elements of the treaty and sovereign nations Corporations are not set up to do that, and they, I think it's ridiculous for us to ask them to do that. The governments have to be in those consultation processes, in those environmental hearings at the same time, and they're the ones that have to deal with that. But they won't unless we make our governments do it. After all, it is our governments. They work for us. And if you don't engage on this thing, you deserve all the crap you're, you're currently getting. Okay? Now, so Aboriginal is the way to get into the social consciousness of all of this in a big way because it's required by law. It's part of the dirty little secret of Canada that we have this image of ourselves. Uh, in fact, here's a great aside truth. The United Nations Human Development Index, when it was um, put, first put in, when they decided where is the best countries in the world to live on a human scale basis, um, the first year it was Ironically, Japan. Canada was second. For the next six years after that, 
Canada was first. You often heard Chrétien talking about that. If you're not old enough, most of you remember those days. But he took a great pride in mentioning that. I actually published a book called The Best Country based on that. But as soon as we put in and factored in Aboriginal well-being and situations, we fell to eighth. And now, and we're continuing to fall down, lower and lower in that. We're doing the same thing in literacy now. We're falling down because we're not making these investments. The oil sands on an economic side are a great source of traditional wealth. On an environmental side, they're a great source of new responsibility, but great innovation. Because think of reclamation. We can take and be the people who have the best technologies, best techniques, best science on reclamation around the planet. And the planet and other industrial sites can use that, in war zones can use that, and natural disasters. And with climate change, we're going to get more and more of those. There is great business in environmental technologies and techniques, and companies have caught on to that. They're now just starting to realize when they make decisions internally, they have sometimes have great socioeconomic impacts on other communities and beyond. They're just starting to think about that now in terms of workforce, their infrastructure development, Aboriginal relations outside approvals and regulatory, and community well-being overall, primarily focused on Fort McMurray, but this city is deeply tied to that as well. In fact, I'm currently working on those kinds of issues on the relationship between this region and the oil sands region on behalf of the city of Edmonton. That's the big, comprehensive, integrated approach. The other element in it is posterity. It's not good enough just to take those three elements, but what's the legacy we're leaving? What's the legacy that I'm leaving you? We're, char we're taking 30% of the operating budget of this province every year out of non-renewable resources. We should be taxing ourselves to that standard. Those non-renewable resources should be going and being your birthright and your, and your children's birthright as opposed to satisfying my low tax rate. But that's what's happening right now. So we're not leaving you the posterity out of this that you should. We're not leaving you the profitability out of this that you should. We might leave you a very, very crappy environment that we shouldn't. And we might not have a very socially cohesive society because the income gaps now are widening and widening and the middle class is starting to disappear. And we're, as a result of all these kinds of policies. Again, on the posterity side, we have to look seriously as to what's the legacy we're leaving in terms of technologies, in terms of, in terms of environment, in terms of social development, and in terms of legacy. Making the next, your generation is going to be the first generation in the history of the modern world that will be worse off than mine. We know that for a fact, okay? Now, I'm a front-end baby boomer. Right? You have every reason to despise me for all the things that we're doing to you. But I'm saying that if women and youth got together as they did for Obama in this province, they'd make all the change in one election. And I'm suggesting the oil sands are the trigger to do that. You're going to hear a lot about CO2. You're going to hear a lot about the debate. And I want to close with my comments. Timing right? I want to close with my comments about that. You will see people saying that this resource is destroying the planet. It's not. It's these buildings, it's our way of life, and our transportation modes that is destroying the planet. I would love to be able to label those, the oil that comes from Alberta to say, this is Alberta oil, please use this product responsibly. It's, as consumers, we have to change as well, significantly change if we're going to reach these standards. But we have to lead that, too, because we have the blessing and the burden. The CO2 emissions out of China are 4.35 billion cubic meters a year. The CO2 emissions in the United States out of coal alone are 1.3 billion megatons. I said I meant megatons in the Chinese per year. The CO2 emissions out of the oil sands are 3.3 million megatons a year. But we're the poster child on CO2. 
We are decimal dust. We're not even a rounding error in the great scheme of things. But I'm suggesting that we take that on as our responsibility anyway. Somebody's got to start it. And we're, if, we, if we, it doesn't happen here, think of all the other petrocultures other than Norway, where this could, and Norway's actually doing it and we're not, that could actually show this leadership. We have stable currency. We have the rule of law. We have a democracy, such as it is, after this Fair Election Act. But um, we have a healthy society. We have an educated society. We have a young society. We have an urban society. We have an educated society. And we have a multicultural society. Where else on the planet can this actually happen where that leadership can be shown? So if somebody says to you that, don't worry about the CO2 coming out of the oil sands, it's negligible, that's true. Look at it this way. On a per capita basis, we're the highest emitters on the planet, because there's not many of us. We have four million people in this province. My closing remarks are, going back to pre cohen 1966, to John F. Kennedy, 1961-1962 the space race. Sputnik had gone up first. The Russians were ahead of them. Yuri Gagarin was the first man in space and, and went around the Earth. That was in April of 61. Sputnik was up in the late 50s. The Amer and this was Cold War stuff. The Americans wanted to catch up, and this was a matter of pride. Kennedy said at the joint, at the joint session of Congress, in 1961 that we will go to the moon in this decade. They made it more public in 1962, and in, 1960, in 1969, they did it. Okay. This oil sands development is Alberta's moonshot. We should make ourselves dedicated within the next decade to make it an epic decade, to make this something that we can be proud of, something that doesn't make this just place just the best place in the world, but the best place for the world. And using hydrocarbons and the wealth coming out of that as the transition economy that it should be to the next post-hydrocarbon economy. It can happen here. It needs to happen someplace. And we're the only place that we have, can generate the wealth and have the stability and the creativity and the infrastructure, both intellectually and physically, to do it. And I think we should take the oil sands and I think we should turn it into a campaign of personal provincial pride and make sure that that's it. By not this, there's not a lot of sacrifice here. If what it takes is intention, a lot of intention and a lot of self-education and a lot of really good bullshit detecting. Thank you very much. Okay, so any comments on Ken's Presentation. Otherwise, uh, you're, yeah. Um, I get like I am totally into all the things you're saying. I just don't know what it means for me. Like I don't know how to like. If I'm like, okay, yes, I'll do that. I don't know what that is. As a as specifically for me, as like self-employed artist. Um. Write a song. Okay. Seriously. It's time for a protest song. It's time for a song that makes people think about consequences. It's time for a, another poem. It's time for artists to actually start responding to this and interpreting it for people. Because while the facts are interesting, they're almost totally irrelevant. It's how you connect with people's values and activate their values. And that's always done through culture and the arts. Artists, I think, have the chance to make the big difference in this really happening. Um, and I think I would encourage you to do that. You are in a, you are in a very special place, and in a special case. OK, deal. Good. <laughs> So uh, the oil sands are our moonshot. What's the target? What a great question. Um, 
morality, our humanity, our place as a biosocial species sharing the planet with other sensate and insensate life forms. If we don't do that, we will ironically, with all the free will and all the intelligence, be the last species um, to, to, well, we will, we will self-extinct. The, um, the, the planet will be fine. Don't worry about the planet. There's just not a guarantee that we, as our species, have a future in it unless we start doing these things seriously. So I think we have to make it a moral issue. I'm not talking about a religious issue, and I'm not talking about an ethical issue. I think we have to do it with understanding our humanity and taking that to heart and looking at it that way. That's why the humanities have to come back and get into this and start leading it, because that, they're not part of the conversation. And that's the group that can integrate all of these things together. The engineers aren't going to do it. The lawyers aren't going to do it. The politicians aren't going to do it. The environmentalists aren't going to do it. But the anthropologists, the sociologists, and others like them are going to do it. I'm easy to find. I, I write a very intermittent blog that I keep promising myself to do more of. But if you um, want to keep, inter well, keep in touch with the fuzzy mind of Ken Chapman, um, there's a blog called oilsandsken.com. Um, I like to play on that because the government guys, when I was working with the oil sands companies, called me Oil Sands Ken. And I thought, the Ken is to know, and it's about my learning about the oil sands. So it's, uh, being an English major, I, like, I live in a metaphor. That I have no other sense of reality except for metaphor. Um, so I use Oil Sands Ken as that. Thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you very much for listening to me, at, uh, and thank you very much for not scaring me. <laughs> I'd like to say thank you for working the word bump into the presentation. Yeah. One of my favorite words. <laughs>